Now we're going to get to something that I really think is incredible, and that's the PDC, the apps of PDC. What, what is the PDC? Well, I'm going to turn it over to Marge Arca and Rob Rico, who are going to explain to you what it is, why it's important, and then we're going to fly through their cases because they got a lot to say in a short amount of time. Marge? Hi, uh, good morning. Um, my name is Marjorie Arca and I'm a surgeon at the University of Rochester uh, Medical Center. And I've been uh, fortunate to be part of the professional development committee of APSA. So um, about uh, five years ago, um, we looked to see um, how we can curate the information that's coming to us from several places, whether it's journals or blogs or guidelines. And there's a number of I, I hate to say, because it ages me, um, prof, uh, senior surgeons uh, that come together um, monthly uh, and uh, also um, twice a year uh, to take a look at these, um, these journals like uh, Jose just uh, presented to you. Um, every uh, month we look at some articles uh, that um, are impactful. In fact, some of the articles that Jose presented to you have been part of the e-blast that, that APSA um, has received from many of our committees. And uh, we actually say, okay, this is important. Um, this is not, we highlight e um, one or two articles, but we present uh, everything. So the professional development committee is uh, there for you. We love doing this. Uh, we actually have uh, communication uh, with um, the American Board of Surgery, and I use some of these information as part of the continuous certification, which uh, then kind of creates this, how can we yeah, implement this in our um, in our lives uh, and gives you the data um, that's impactful. So um, the pro uh, professional development committee also uh, um, puts together the topics for the top edu educational content. It's a, a tech talk uh, that uh, we have uh, for an annual meeting, and we highlight uh, several things uh, for our tech talks. And um, the points of these are some of the things that uh, Dr. Rika and I will be presenting to you. We're, we're your, um, your PDC representatives, also a number of you here are also uh, PDC members. So, um, ooh. oh no, I'm the first one to uh, figure out the... Uh... So, so Marge, so what, we can advance while you get that oh, going. Yeah, sure. Why don't we, I also have a little here. trick for the faculty, by the way. So Garrett just told me, if you pin the one square that has the PowerPoint, it will make it big for you and it won't mess up uh, the, the others. So you can pin for people like me that can't see it that small. So uh, Marge, do you have the clicker ready or do you want- um, No, Dustin? I think I'll just have you. I'll just okay. have you do that. All right. Uh, Garrett, can we go to the next slide? All right, next. All right, so the first thing that um, we're gonna talk about is uh, family-centered care. This was highlighted at our May uh, 2021 uh, meeting. Um, so go ahead and advance this uh, for us, uh, Garrett. Um, this scenario that I'll present to you actually happened to me. A three-year-old uh, girl of Hmong descent, I put that there just because of our um, recent Olympics and wanted to highlight the Hmong community. Uh, this girl has a necrotiz necrotizing soft tissue infection of the lower extremity. As the patient is being wheeled back to the pre-op suite, her grandmother placed a red string bracelet on her left wrist. You ask about it and the interpreter said that it is to help protect her during the surgery. Your nursing team in the OR is uncomfortable with the sterility of the bra bracelet. So the best course of action is A, tell the family that the bracelet is not sterile and ask them to remove it. B, tell the nurses that they're being ridiculous and just keep the bracelet on, uh, keep the case going. Um, C, remove the bracelet once the child is in the operating room. D, acknowledge the bracelet's importance and ask if it can be covered while the patient is in the operating room. And E, just ask the anesthesia staff uh, to deal with the situation. All right, what do you guys think? All right, so let's put the poll up there, which it's up there. So what do people think here in the faculty? Steve, you unmuted. I would say D, uh, definitely want to incorporate parents' wishes and, and really see how, um, what can be done and, and respect, uh, respect their, uh, their beliefs and values. Great. Anybody else think differently? I agree with D. Yeah. Most uh, people in the pool agree too. Okay. 
Was there anyone that did not um, uh, uh, pick uh, D, Ellen? Yes, a very small percentage are saying to tell the family the bracelet is not sterile and it needs to be removed, but it's like 13%. Okay. No, no, um, like now, I said, now, this was a... Let me say one thing. If I, I love that you asked that, Marge. If there's a, if there's a small minority, please, you will see, put your comments on why. You'll see how, how, how little most of us know about anything. So don't be shy. Say why you did something different. This is the time to do it. So um, why don't we keep going? But this is, this is uh, I like that you called out what, why someone answered something different. Were there any comments, Ellen? Not, not yet. Um, they, someone is asking if we can take it off and put it next to the patient instead of on their wrist. Right. Well, um, I should, like I said, this was uh, something that happened to me and thankfully um, a few years ago and D was not what was done. Um, uh, the anesthesia staff actually said, it's not sterile for God's sakes. This is a necrotizing soft tissue infection uh, and all that stuff. But, um, you know, I think it is part of our DEI uh, concept, part of our family engagement and uh, really knowing that uh, the way that we could get to the best possible outcomes is um, by engaging the family, respecting their beliefs, listening to them. Um, there's a, you know, I, I believe that the PowerPoint presentation is uh, available to everybody. And there's a, actually a relatively busy uh, slide um, that came from the AAP Committee on uh, Patient and uh, Family Engagement and that uh, took a look at this and um, had six pillars of, um, of engagement um, for the families, including uh, listening to them, incorporating their beliefs. Um, also um, looking at the policies and procedures of your hospital to make sure that they are um, uh, facilitating uh, the family engagement as opposed to um, obstructing uh, the um, respect that people can have uh, for people's beliefs. Um, also, um, uh, um, incorporating them, sharing with them information as best as you can, uh, specifically with interpreters, um, only be and, and not uh, diminishing uh, their knowledge about their own um, children um, so that they can make the most loving and most thoughtful um, uh, co contribution to their children's care. All right, let's go to the next one. Can I just make one quick comment um, yep. as a plug for the, um, the cultural differences that we have? Um, I think it's really important for us to be um, educating ourselves on different cultures um, and particularly the Hmong uh, people just um, uh, in terms of um, education. There's a really great book called The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down and it is, um, it is just a fantastic uh, way to connect with that culture in particular and understand why they have those differences in opinion and why they don't trust the medical system. But I think it's something that we need to do for all cultures, not just the Hmong. That's a great, great. Hey, Dr. Sullins. Thank you. Yeah, this is very, very helpful case to present because we haven't had one like that before. Let's go to the next one. Okay, keep um, advancing, please. We'll go to uh, the next um, thing. I'm trying to uh, catch up our time. Um, so we focus on family-centered care because it actually um, does a lot of things. It reduces uh, ED visits. It increases the anxiety of parents and children. And as you know, if parents are anxious, children are anxious. If children are anxious, parents are anxious. And the staff is anxious. And having them know, having them feel respected, engaged and involved decreases their length of stay, reduces medical errors, and also improves uh, staff satisfaction. Thus, it's cost effective and uh, decreases legal claims and legal expenses. So I think it's a win-win uh, for everybody. Our next talk is about intestinal rehabilitation. Again, this is one of our top um, educational content from APSA, and there's a few things that are actually quite interesting. And um, on the PowerPoint, I should uh, let you know that if you are interested, the, um, the references uh, that I used are, are listed in, um, on, uh, as you can see on the section um, page. All right, let's uh, go ahead and look at our case scenario. 
A five-month-old child underwent laparotomy for mid-gut volvulus. They actually had an upper GI and not an ultrasound associated with malrotation. Unfortunately, he has a 20 centimeters of small bowel distillatopile loris that was anastomosed to the mid-transverse colon. Which medication should he receive as he starts enteral feedings? So our choices are proton pump inhibitor, loperamide, metronidazole, uh, perhaps for bowel overgrowth, teleglutide or citrulline. So as people are putting this together, um, I'm gonna ask um, Dr. St. Peter, what do you think? or anybody else from the panel? What, um, what do you think uh, we should start on this, um, this poor baby? I think, I think you stumped everybody. Really? <laughs> well, I, I think we should I, put this I, on the CCA. <laughs> so to reiterate the question, oh, Mark, were you gonna say something? Well, I, th I think, you know, the, the, the initial gut feeling, pun intended, is uh, uh -huh. that the patient should be on a PPI, uh, but I have a feeling that the answer might be something different. So, I mean, um, we'll talk us through it. Looks like, let's see what the answers are here. Ellen? Yeah, it's about, there's, we're in thirds. A third are saying PPI, a third are saying loperamide, and a third are saying teleglutide. Okay, um, so actually the answer is PPI, Dr. Walken. So I'm, um, I'm pretty stoked about that. Oh, oh no. God, now his head's gonna get so, so big. No, I, and, and Marge, I, you know, I don't know, it's maybe a trust thing. It's like, I wasn't trusting you not to be tricking us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do have a reputation for being a trickster. So um, let's go ahead and advance um, a little bit because uh, this is a, it's a really important topic uh, because there's a lot of things going on. So just very briefly, uh, factors associated with achieving enteral autonomy, that is to say they're being fed uh, without needing um, TPN, include obviously longer residual um, small bowel, younger age at the time of the intestinal resection because they, uh, it allows for more length as they grow, um, preservation of the ileocecal valve, um, a, a lot uh, being written about having that valve actually decrease uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. The diagnosis of necrotizing angiocolitis, um, as opposed to other diagnoses such as midgut volvulus, unfortunately, um, absence of liver disease and normal gastrointestinal motility. Can you advance the um, slide for me, please? So this is a very dense slide um, and looks at current guidelines that are put together by, the, by NASPGAN, uh, which is, and ESPGAN, uh, the European and uh, North American uh, gastrointestinal uh, uh, groups that look at um, trying to get children uh, to enteral autonomy. So here are the current guidelines. If possible, start enteral nutrition. Um, start and advance enteral feeding as possible because that helps uh, with intestinal rehabilitation. When possible, start human milk. And uh, whether it's the mother's express breast milk or donor milk, um, it is helpful because the, this um, substrate is associated with fewer days of parental uh, nutrition and also um, protective uh, for the liver. But if you are not able to give um, milk, amino acid-based formulas seem to have more favorable outcomes than protein hydrolysate formulas. Now, if the baby has diarrhea, of course, um, you know, start continuous feedings. However, if bolus feedings are tolerated, that helps too with cyclical secretion of hormones. And therefore what is thought is that that also helps uh, with uh, the growth of the GI tract. In terms of parental nutrition, um, the guidelines say I uh, use uh, a SMOF lipids, uh, which is a four combination lipids of um, soy, um, fish oil, uh, olive oil um, here, and um, uh, and fish oil, media and medium uh, chain oil. Sorry about that. Um, and um, 
because this is protective. Now, if the, the liver function tests go up, if there's evidence of uh, liver dysfunction, then you can use omega -Ven. Um, The omega -Ven, um, however, can decrease uh, the amount of lipids that they get. So that's something that one should, um, um, their weight should be something that one should monitor um, if this is to be employed. So right when you do a massive uh, small bowel resection, um, people say start PPI because there's a reflex hypergastrinemia that happens. And that actually um, impacts how much you can feed. And that, that high level of gastrin is part of the, the stuff that comes out of their ileostomy of, or their bottom. And so PPI or H2 blockers um, are recommended with a, high, um, a strong recommendation, high level of evidence. Now, teleglutide is something that's creeping up uh, in our uh, literature. It's being used in uh, adults more, but it's glucagon-like peptide too, and it increases epithelial prol proliferation. It has been um, approved uh, in children, uh, but the outcomes are not um, as, um, as impactful in adults because the outcomes that they look at are number of days off TPN. Now with our kids, sometimes it's number of hours off TPN. So I think we should continue to look at this literature as it evolves. Um, other types of medical therapy include uh, aggressive uh, treatment of small intestinal overgrowth. And citrullate is just something that I put as like E. It's actually a marker of intestinal absorption it is not something that you give the child. And then for us surgeons, it's um, imperative that we establish intestinal continuity as soon as possible. Because uh, um, having this enteral nutrition start um, with the human milk, um, et cetera, et cetera, really helps with their intestinal uh, rehabilitation. And, do, and try not to do the intestinal lengthening procedure um, as soon as possible. And this is something that's also evolving. Um, what they've said is hold off um, for a few months until adaptation actually starts, because then you could get more length uh, to that bowel that you have. And then intestinal transplantation, interestingly, is getting less and less um, um, uh, common uh, nowadays, because our centers are just getting very, very good at doing this. All right. Any, um, any questions or any comments, Ellen, uh, from our audience? Is there time for a short comment? Of course. Yeah, so we, we always hear the, the role of the ileocecal valve in prognostication for uh, TPN dependence, but uh, I think the ileocecal valve is inseparable from the terminal ileum. So, uh, and some recent studies have actually shown that that it's more relevant the, the resection of the terminal ileum if you uh, actually categorize those ileocecal resections with certain degrees of terminal ileum resection. The ileocecal valve is not that important. It's more of a, a marker of how much terminal ileum you have resected. The, um, the last part of the literature that I've, I've seen, Dr. Campos, um, um, does. I mean, that is actually a very valid point, but um, some of the gastrointestinal uh, literature actually just highlights it because of the ability of the uh, ileocecal valve uh, to, um, to decrease the um, occurrence of, um, of SIBO or a bacterial overgrowth. And a lot of times that actually impedes uh, your ability to uh, increase. But that's a really, a really interesting and compelling uh, point that it's just a prognosticator of how much ileum you actually have. And we all know that the ileum has reabsorptive capacities of certain very important um, in, um, nutrients. So. I had a, a couple of questions from, from the chat. Someone asked, um, so the PPI should be started right away and not just when we're starting feeds, correct? Yes, correct. Um, and they also asked, how do you determine the time to hold off before you decide about the length lengthening procedure? So I think um, this is kind of like where the art of surgery starts, right? So um, um, what we, um, about a year of age-ish, and also you want to take a look at the, um, the width of your um, of your intestine. So it, it needs to be something that you could do an intestinal length lengthening procedure on. At least in my hands, I use a, the, um, the step procedure. Um, and um, I also look to see how much 
um, they've stalled on their feedings. If they're doing well, then allow them to, to feed and grow. But if they're, they've gotten to a point where they have uh, stalled, they have stalled in their feedings because um, of you know several bouts of uh, um, small intestinal uh, bacterial overgrowth, or um, or things are just not getting absorbed. Then that's something that I start I start planning at that time. Hey Marge, can I just comment? Um, if this is not my area of specialty uh, for sure, but I know that uh, in the folks in our organization who treat this they have real concerns about the lengthening procedures and um, that they have um, really deleterious effects on motility and that that can actually be worse than, than having a, a bowel that's uh, short. So I think it is an area of controversy as to when and, and upon whom do you uh, do a uh, intestinal lengthening procedure and then which one is the right procedure to do. I agree, Dr. Von Elman. I think um, now I, I would say that uh, before uh, in you know my previous practice, I would do um, an intestinal lengthening procedure probably twice a year, uh, and it's it's kind of one of those things that oh you know he hasn't uh, uh, he hasn't advanced in about two months now and all that stuff. But now I do think um, I mean that the intestinal lengthening procedures are becoming rare. Rarer and rarer. Now, to, to be sure, um, we have um, uh, a database uh, that is kept at Boston Children's uh, regarding this, and it would be uh, amazing uh, if uh, we have some outcomes uh, from that database uh, and consortium uh, soon. However, um, I would say that we have gotten so good at our medical therapy, at you know being on top of giving them the nutrients that they need, of starting enteral therapy soon, and um, having all these other um, things in our armamentarium uh, with our uh, intestinal rehabilitation centers, that it's, uh, uh, it's becoming rare to do this in intestinal lengthening procedure. And I, I um, share the concerns that your colleagues have as well. Okay. All let's right, um, let's move on. Yeah. All right, so this, all right, let's take a look at our next, um, our next slide, please. All right, an 11 month old child was seen by his babysitter to put something in his mouth. At an outside urgent care, um, in a, a critical access hospital, a chest x-ray was obtained below. The patient should undergo immediate, A, contrast esophagram, B, administration of honey, C, administration of caraphate, D, bougenage, or E, transfer to a pediatric center. Now, before people answer that, um, do you want to leave may... it as is, or do you want to highlight specific things on that x-ray? Or um... Um, I would like the x-ray to, if possible, uh, can we look at the x-ray a little bit bigger or not? Probably not. I don't know if there's a All way right. to... But, oh, wow. Oh, Whoa, boy. Garrett. Dr. Pons, Damn, whoever that tech was. support is amazing. Whoa. <laughs> what? <laughs> All right. Talk us through that, Marge. Yeah, so um, this is, as you can see, a foreign body uh, in the upper uh, thoracic uh, inlet in the midclavicular area. Now, um, if you take a look a little bit to um, screen left is... Um, uh, you could see the airway there getting a little bit pushed over, and then you could see a um, circumferential thing with a halo, a circumferential um, radio opaque um, material that has a halo. This strikes fear at the heart of, of uh, ENT surgeons, gastroenterologists, and pediatric surgeons. So um, anyway, uh, I what, what do you think this is, Dr. Sullins? This is the dreaded button battery. <laughs> you and I have had our fair share of uh, interesting foreign objects lodged in infants' uh, esophag the esophagus and, and uh, oral pharynx, but um, this is- I would take our fishbone one, Dr. Sullins, uh, uh, over <laughs> this to be sure. All right. So but that's a critical talk. picture that should be burned into everyone's mind, that ring, that little ring there, indicating that this is a battery that they swallowed and not a coin. All right. So back to the question. So what do people want to do with this? Um, so do you want to get, do you want to get an esophagram? Do you want to give honey? Do you want to give sucrophate? Do you want to do, put a bougie down? 
uh, or do you want to transfer to a pediatric center? And while we're waiting for those answers, ta- if, if the bougenage thing is interesting. We would, that's a, you know what? I don't even want to go there because the whole <laughs> question for, for how do we treat a coin is going to take us to a whole different discussion. I, um, I know. I just put that there to be, to tease I, you all. I, I love it. <laughs> so, Ellen, what do we got here? Um, yeah, most people are saying to transfer about, well, 50% are saying to transfer to a pediatric center and then um, about a quarter are saying administer honey and a small 15% are saying bougenage. Okay. All right. Mar- Marge, what do we got? What do people want to say? Marge, tell us. Okay. Um, so uh, we actually, um, this, is, it, this is one of those things that really, um, this is more, to me, this strikes fear in my heart as much as a level one trauma gunshot to the you know cavity mm-hmm. of something um we we have developed some guidelines regarding how to deal with this because this is a time limited issue much like midgut volvulus is so indeed if you're in a critical access hospital someone needs to be calling the pediatric transfer center but right now this button battery is doing two things it's creating an alkali burn uh, in the esophagus, and it's also um, it's, it's it's a live battery. It's uh, causing an electrical burn uh, in the area. So um, about three years ago, uh, the U.S. put together um, something poison.org, um, and there's a lot of of people who experts who's actually looked at this. And as you are transferring to the pediatric center, that may take you some time. And what you need to do is cut down on the um, uh, damage, the injury that this is is, um, doing. So the two things that we have um, been taught to do is to give honey uh, 10 mLs every 10 minutes, um, as much as you can, or you could give uh, sopralfate. Um, Now, this is the trick question um, because um, you're not supposed to give honey in children uh, less than 11 months old. Um, I asked my colleagues if I should use this on uh, an administered, administered test, but they thought that was too tricky. But I thought this would be fair game for, for our audience. So for this particular child, it would be caraphate because he's 11 months old and he's not supposed uh, to get honey. Uh, Bougenage, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because you need to see, um, once they get to the pediatric center, this is one of those, you know, um, you know, uh, immediate to the operating room. One needs to go at, uh, remove it under direct visualization and actually take a look at the injury that's there. Um, and so if you, if you go ahead and uh, uh, go to the next slide, please. So here's the immediate management, and I put it there because, you know, hopefully we don't have it like committed to memory because it doesn't happen every day. But in a child greater than 12 months, give honey t- 10 mLs every 10 minutes. In a child less than 12 months, give a caraphate suspension, um, one gram uh, per, t- per, per 10 mLs or 10 mLs every, um, every hour times three. And that coats the, um, the battery. And then when possible, um, it must be removed from the esophagus within two hours of inge- ingestion. And the, the, the points in this is actually, um, one of the points in the next, the next um, thing is actually new to me. You, accept, you assess the mucosal damage, usually seen in the negative pole of the battery. But if there is no evidence of perforation, um, the new poison guidelines say irrigate the injured area with 50 to 150 mLs of quarter percent sterile acetic acid. So this is something that was new to me. I knew the honey about the caraphate, but I thought I'd share this with the audience and then determine the need for repeat endoscopy or studies uh, based on the injury. And then uh, go ahead and uh, go to the next one. So this is a terrible, terrible um, um, issue that can cause several terrible uh, sequelae, including tracheoesophageal fistulas, uh, fistulization to large vessels, including the aorta, perforation of the esophagus, mediastinitis, empyema, pneumonia, lung abscess, and then something with the vertebrae. And um, we have, um, there are case reports of children who um, had uh, this problem and then comes back with a sentinel bleed, um, um, a little bit of hemoptysis, and then, um, you know, has a, a big aortoesophageal fistula with uh, fatal consequences. So that's, um, th- again, this is 
this is almost uh, as bad as that level one trauma with you know gunshot wound to the abdomen or chest because it can be just as fatal. Um, next slide, please. So management of complications uh, with acquired tracheoesophageal fistulas. Thankfully, there's not a lot there, but when I took a look at some of the literature case reports that are out, the first line of therapy is if they're stable, observe it and uh, do enteral feeding distal to the injury and um, not necessarily uh, rush them to the operating room, although a fair number of children do uh, end up uh, needing um, surgical uh, repair of that fistula. And again, with the urinary fistulas, remember that they can occur weeks after the injury. And if they have a, a hemoptysis, uh, then you need to work them up and not just say, oh, that's just, you know, just, just a sore throat uh, that you've got. So acetic acid is vinegar. <laughs> and interestingly, what the poison.org um, says is your, um, <laughs> your pharmacy should put together the vinegar. Um, I, should, I should let you know that, you know, that um, x-ray was actually a child that we had uh, probably about two weeks ago. And I myself have, um, have uh, starting a quality improvement project with our ED, our surrounding hospitals, and our pharmacy so that we could have honey and acetic acid in certain places that are strategic, especially in the middle of the night. Quick, quick things before we go to the next case, because this time we had to move ahead. But just to answer rapid fire, uh, there's a request for the data. If you could post the literature a URL or something about sucrophate and honey, blah, blah, blah. Yes, it is a, this is a thing that I learned only a few years ago uh, from Phil Gazetta at the, the DC Fellows course. The other um, interesting thing about, there's a question about Botox. A botulism, you can get botulism uh, if you're under a year. Um, right. I, I actually saw it uh, for my first time this past year. I've not seen it actually, but I saw it. Um, and uh, this is all as you're on your way to the OR. So everyone gets, we're going to the OR, but this is what to do to try to minimize the, the impact. Great discussion. Let's go on to the next one. Okay. All right, let's see. Let's go ahead. Um, can you give me my next slide, please? Oh, okay, this is the poison.org. All right, next question, please. Okay, there's a six month old patient who has history of intestinal atresia and gastroschisis uh, who presents to the emergency room with watery uh, diarrhea. In this age group, uh, C. diff or C Clostridium uh, difficile testing should A, not be done, B is accomplished by sending only C. diff toxin A. B is accomplished by sending C. diff toxin B. D, uh, you should send both A and B toxins. And E, you should actually in this age group send some cultures. So there we go. Um, um, Ellen, can we, uh, there you go. Ellen just posted it. Um, so, so what would people do while we're waiting for the audience to answer? Do we do, we, do we check anything? Um, do we uh, send toxin A, toxin B, A and B, or C. diff cultures? What do people think in the faculty here while we're waiting for the audience to answer? Do, 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 somebody answer. You guys are all wimps. You're not answering because nobody knows. See, Marge, right. no one's answering because nobody knows the answer. Send A and B because we send everything call. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's and everything that it's, it's all going to get sent regardless of what you recommend but um I, I know the general recommendation is to not test kids under a year of age because of colonization under six months it's about 30 percent that are colonized and up to 14 percent by a year so a lot of things can be causing this diarrhea but the danger you're, you could walk into is badly over treating a patient that has c diff true has diarrhea true and the two are unrelated See, I never know if Sean is telling the truth or making sense, but he always sounds so smart. So by definition, I just believe smart. it. <laughs> because he is smart, Dr. Ponsky. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So is Sean right? That's exactly right. Um, <laughs> Sean is exactly right. Um, this, and these are com coming from uh, the Infectious Disease Society guidelines. And uh, this has been going on for actually a few years. And uh, I kind of wanted to... Uh, I do this again because it does stump some people because C. diff is just one of those things that you're like, oh, diarrhea, C. diff. Um, there's a high prevalence of asymptomatic car uh, carry carriage 
of uh, toxigenic um, uh, C. diff. Uh, so it should never be routinely recommended in uh, children who are less than 12 months of age. This is a very strong uh, recommendation from IDSA and a, re a moderate uh, to strong quality of evidence. Now, um, go ahead and um, advance the slides uh, for us if possible. So and, and while you're while you're waiting for that, I just want to there's comments and questions that go on after a topic is over. Sure. Exactly. That's exactly how this this is meant to be uh, a cursory overview of main things. We all know each other here. If you want anyone's contact information, we'll give it to you. If you want to ask specific questions to any of the faculty after the fact, I'm sure they'll all be fine with that. These conversations will keep going after. This is to just open our eyes today. We're not going to dig that deep. So sorry, Marge, keep going. Oh yeah, um, Todd, I also should say that if our uh, audience has the ability to access the PowerPoint in, um, on the title page or the section um, uh, introducing each one of these things are the references that I've used uh, for these guidelines. Um, so anyway, so no C. diff testing in less than 12 months of age, in one to two years of age, no routine C. diff testing unless you've already rolled out other causes such as rotavirus and all that stuff, things that are more common. And in greater than two years of age, there's a little bit of a hesitancy as to whether to send or not. Um, they actually said, uh, just do it if they have prolonged or worsening diarrhea and risk factors of an underlying inflammatory bowel disease, immunocompromising conditions and um, relevant exposures such as being in the hospital for, you know, for several, um, uh, several times. So um, that's who to test. Now, uh, let's go ahead to the next slide, just because it's not just who to test, but how to treat it if they have it. Um, so now uh, the, um, the recommendations are still the initial episode or first recurrence of non-severe um, C. diff is either metronidazole or vancomycin. That hasn't changed in several years. Uh, and the initial episode of severe CDI now is oral vancomycin um, should be given, and that's a preference over metronidazole, and a second or greater dose of recurrent CDI is oral vancomycin. Now, recently, like three months ago, adult guide guidelines were, um, were brought up by IDSA, and I just want you to, uh, to take a look at this because usually the pediatric guidelines, you know, um, follow adult guidelines after a couple of years. And now, interestingly, phydaxomycin is now the new um, uh, preferred treatment for non-severe CDI. Phydaxomycin is an RNA polymerase uh, that is um, uh, used specifically for C. diff. Um, vancomycin is now considered a, an alternative uh, in, the, in adults. And with recurrent CDI, they are also um, recommending phydaxomycin. I should note that the um, FDA has uh, approved phydaxomycin in children. So that's why I'm putting this here because uh, their recommendations might change. Uh, in multiple recurrences, vancomycin extended pulse regimen and uh, vancomycin followed by rifaximin. Uh, is what uh, they um, actually um, uh, recommend in adults and maybe fecal transplants. And now this is a new thing that they actually have, um, the use of Zinflava, which is a monoclonal antibody uh, for um, CD, C. diff toxin B, um, is uh, something that is being considered in uh, recurrent CDI episodes in uh, adults. Okay. So just wanting to let you know that that All might right. be um, in the future. Marge, you just said a ton of stuff. Let's do this rapid fire because I want to make sure I got it all. Okay. Under, so, so do each one in like one sentence. Under a year of age, nothing, right? Nothing. That, yeah. Um, between one and two, that's when you would do it only selectively after everything is ruled. I want to make sure. Correct. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Over two, you make sure you've ruled out everything else and you and send if they have risk, risk If they have risk, um, risk factors. If they have risk IDD. factors. And mm -hmm. what do you send? Uh, C. diff B. Toxin B. B. C. diff B. All right, everyone got that? Over two years of age, C. diff B, after you've, you know, the, if they have risk factors, you ruled everything else under that, probably won't be helpful. Maybe I'm saying this too simple. And that there, as you can see, a whole new list of, of new types of treatments that are making its way. And we will review this after the fact as a, another video that we'll push out through social media where we can, people can watch this over again. Plus, you can come back and watch it and, and stay current. You know, it'd be great, Marge, I'm going to ask you for a favor. Sure. We put guidelines in the Stay Current app. 
Can you, do you have, we, it'd be great to have this as a guideline on C diff management in the state current app. If, uh, if, if you have it or if someone you know has it, send it to us, we'll put it in. All right, what's next? Okay, I don't know, what is next? I'm not done. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is actually uh, uh, also something that we covered uh, in our top educational content talks, which is updates on esophageal atresia and TF care. Um, from uh, the uh, ESPGAN, ESPGAN guidelines uh, that was published in uh, 2016. So let's uh, have our uh, clinical scenario. So you are seeing a nine-month-old patient who underwent repair of type C, T, F, E, A as a newborn. So a, um, proximal uh, esophageal atresia and a distal uh, fistula. He's doing uh, she's doing great. Um, she's meeting all her milestones. She's on formula and baby food, and she has occasional spit-ups. She's gaining weight appropriately. Parents have no concerns at all. And you know, um, as you're you know, looking at um, her records, uh, that um, she has outgrown her current dose of PPI. So based on the current recommendations, what would you do uh, with um, her proton pump inhibitor? Would you discontinue it? Would you downgrade it to an H2 blocker? Should you adjust it because it's now kind of underdosed? Sh should you perform an esophagram to make the decision uh, or perform um, the esophagoscopy with biopsies to make the decision? And I'm so glad you're bringing this up because we debate this all the time. I think the literature changes. Um, it so does. <laughs> I, I, should, I should have looked last night to make sure that <laughs> but, but, but the But the most important thing is that we're paying attention to this now. That, that right. you know, the little things, we do this, we do that. But the fact is we used to pat ourselves on the back and say we're done. And now we're realizing we need to make sure we follow them. So uh, any comments from faculty before Ellen reads us the poll results? which are changing and is starting to look like a rainbow. Comments? All right. All right. Unrelated comment, there's a, there's a recent study that looks at clinical knowledge of societal guidelines on esophageal atresia, and the results are, are really low. They just send out some um, surveys on how updated the clinicians were, just, just to, to highlight what you're saying, that these things change very frequently, and not even 50% of the clinicians treating for esophageal atresia were up to date on the guidelines. That's it. But I won't comment on the PPI because I have the same question. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Well, let's go ahead and go to the next slide then, because I want to make sure that I don't forget um, some of the salient points. So okay. um, with the uh, current uh, ESPGAN, NASPGAN guidelines, uh, what they actually say is that the uh, GR should be treated with uh, PPI in all esophageal atresia patients up to 12 months uh, or more. So in this particular patient, um, she's, she's only nine months of age, um, I would um, increase her uh, PPI to um, be in con concordance uh, with her weight. Um, esophagoscopies um, are actually recommended as a matter of course um, for uh, children who underwent TEF EA repair. And uh, the uh, timing is about a year, sorry, that's one year after stopping PPI therapy. Um, one, um, uh, one year um, um, or one should be done before 10 years of age and one at transition to adulthood. Now there are um, recommendations um, regarding fundal plication um, that, they, that fundal plication should be considered uh, in uh, certain very specific states. Uh, for instance, the recurrent anastomotic uh, strictures, uh, usually in a long gap esophageal atresia, poorly contr controlled reflux despite medical therapy, uh, long-term post pyloric feeding and cyanotic spells. And the workup would be a contrast esophagram pH study and endoscopy with biopsies to docu uh, document esophagitis. Right, and Steve uh, Rothenberg's on here. So see, Steve, not every single patient gets a Nissen. <laughs> I'm glad that came from you, Dr. Ponce. <laughs> um, um, next is they do uh, believe that a multidisciplinary approach, uh, gastroenterologist, pediatric surgeon, um, ENT uh, physician uh, should uh, be part of the care of these complicated patients because just because they're not complicated um, on FOSS doesn't mean that they are not complicated. Um, and with adult transition, 
um, routine endoscopy with biopsies in four quadrants at the GE junction and an asthmatic site should be done at the time of transition to an adult uh, gastroenterologist, and then maybe every five to 10 years with additional endoscopy if new or worsening symptoms develop as these, um, these patients can be at higher risk for early onset uh, esophageal uh, cancer. And in the presence of Barrett's, then per consensus recommendation for management of Barrett's. So let me try to rapidly fire summary for you do PPI for a year. Then yes. after that, you do esophagoscopy three times over the next 18 years, essentially. Right. If, right they're, after if they're doing well, you can stop the PPI uh, therapy. Um, and uh, then you could just make sure that they don't have anything. I should note too, that in this particular uh, set of patients, Todd, they have a higher risk of um, eosinophilic esophagitis. So that should be in the back of your mind if they're having dysphagia, that they're not quite, it's not al always, oh, it's a stricture. I should just get you know IR to dilate, depending on your situation, of course, but they have a higher risk of eosinophilic esophagitis and should be treated. And that may help you with their yep. symptoms. This yeah, is, I, go ahead. Marge, I think this is, I mean, the key point you made is it needs to be a multidisciplinary approach and it needs to be ongoing. I mean, I, I think when I trained, the approach was you treated them for reflux until they were 18. And then you just said, see you later and good luck for the adults who are going to manage these patients. But they really do need to be monitored with esophagoscopy um, to uh, evaluate the esophagus long term and that you don't really need to treat reflux beyond a year. Yes, it, it, it's, it's, it's hard to, to keep up. I, I agree that, um, and one of the things I would love on a separate session we should do is the, the management of a stricture and how to know how, how often you keep going in trying to dilate or do whatever treatments you do versus just doing a wrap. Uh, yeah, should. there's no data from Boston uh, regarding the use of uh, intralesional steroids. Um, or uh, anastomotic steroids. That, that, that could be something that we could discuss next time. Exactly. Um, we, anyway, yeah. I hope this was helpful. Um, the PDC really love what we do and love the uh, ability to share this information with you. And like you said, Dr. Ponsky, this is curated information. I'm happy to share the guidelines for uh, the uh, TEF EA uh, as well for the Stay Current app. Actually, that would be amazing. And I'll ask anyone on here or anyone in the audience, if there's a great guideline that's evidence-based guideline that we should be considering to put in the app, let us know. Um, I know that Kansas City has given us a ton, Cincinnati has, but I would love them from other places. So uh, that's half of it, half of the PDC. Now we have the other half. Dr. Robert Rika is going to take us through some other considered important points that pediatric surgeons around the world need to know about. So Rob, bring us, bring us up to speed. Great, thank you, Todd. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Marge, for uh, starting us off. It, it is a pleasure to uh, to be here, and uh, hello from uh, Greenville, South Carolina, to everybody around the world. Uh, hopefully, these uh, topics are something that's interesting, uh, not just for um, us here in the States, but uh, also uh, globally. And I, I think the first topic, actually, that we're going to discuss um, initially may be thinking something that has really focused on North America, but I, I think as you start to look at it globally, um, there are probably some points that we can use um, to provide better care to children globally and um, for pediatric surgery. So the first topic we're going to talk about is right child, right surgeon. Um, the question over the last 20 years, there's been a significant increase in the number of pediatric surgery fellowship training programs in North America. How has this increase in pediatric surgeons affected surgical care of children? Has it improved access to care in rural areas? Or are we seeing more pediatric surgeons going to rural areas? Has it increased the number of index cases that pediatric surgeons are, are seeing? Has it increased the overall surgical volume of pediatric surgeons? Um, has it increased access to care in urban areas? Or are we seeing more pediatric surgeons going to urban areas? And, or has it delayed surgical subspecialization of pediatric surgeons? So are we seeing that colorectal surgery, uh, surgical critical care, those fellowships are being done later? So interested to see what anybody thinks on that one. By the way, while we're waiting for any comments from anyone on this, while we're waiting for the, anyone feel strongly about this? This is interesting because we have such a wide geographic audience. I had an amazing conversation. Who here in the, in the audience or in the faculty has heard of Ernica? Uh, um, 
Ernica, I never knew anything about it. Ernica is the European um, group that has decided to regionalize care um, so that there's esophageal centers, there's this and such and such centers. And it's an incredible group where they're trying to better utilize the man, the, the man and woman power of surgeons around Europe. And um, we honestly in the United States should really look at, at something like that here. I know it's a different payment model, so it may not work. And I know that's a little unrelated to this, but it's a way of distribution of, of pediatric specialty care. So uh, Ellen, what did everyone say? Yeah, um, let's see, most people are saying increased access to urban areas, which is 40%, and then the other majorities are either delayed surgical subspecialization or improved access to rural areas. So that, that, Todd, that was a great, uh, actually, transition in, and I, I think that we do have to look at some other models, and, and really the right child, right surgery uh, discussion, this was a manuscript that came out in JPS at the end of uh, 2020, and it started to look at how we're providing surgical care in North America. Um, APSA was founded, uh, founded in 1970. Um, since then, we have 1,300 uh, pediatric surgeons as members, so we've grown significantly over that time, and, and we have increased the number of fellowship training programs, but most of those individuals tend to go to urban areas to large academic medical centers. We're not seeing an increase in the rural uh, areas, the rural um, uh, places that may need our assistance, but there's other um, issues as well that we're looking at with regard to See if the slide will move. Can we get the next slide here? Sorry. There we go. <clears throat> so other recognized obstacles to the pediatric surgical care is with this increase in uh, the number of surgeons, um, we're seeing decreased case volume. We're seeing a, a decrease in the number of index cases that are being performed. We're also seeing that people have inadequate resources, whether they're in a rural area or if they're even in an urban center. Do we have the nursing staff? Do we have the uh, ancillary services that are needed for providing surgical care to children. Our current training paradigms need to be taken a look at uh, for the most of the general surgery residencies in the United States. And there's a recent article that came out um, just this month that we reviewed at the Outcomes Committee um, that's looking at the decrease in surgical exposure during general surgery residency to pediatric patients. We're also seeing potentially a decrease in the autonomy of uh, our fellows as they're going through their training. So is that going to be a problem? Uh, surgeons are performing fewer index cases, and the distribution, as I mentioned, um, is not uh, being distributed equally amongst all of the children. Um, greater than 10 million children in the U.S. alone are greater than uh, 60 miles away from a pediatric surgeon. So how do we overcome that? Um, and then timing of subspecialization. A lot of our uh, trainees are going through subspecialization in colorectal surgery, surgical critical care before they're starting pediatric surgery fellowships. And that is continuing on. We're not seeing that training later on. And there's reasons for that, understandably so. Um, but how does that affect the end product? And are those individuals then coming back after completing a fellowship in pediatric surgery and then specializing in colorectal? Or are they just going into a general practice, potentially not using the skill set that they have? Can we go to the next slide? So uh, the Right Child Right Surgery uh, manuscript discussed that in length and started to say that we should start to evaluate our current training paradigms. Do we need to look at having uh, other types of surgeons train for rural surgery, for community practices? Dr. Fallett brought this up as her presidential address several years ago. Is that something that we should be looking at? Um, we should be, in general, the driving force for these changes as pediatric surgeons. We're the leaders in pediatric surgery. We need to be the driving force. We need to promote the American College of Surgeons Children's Surgical Verification that Dr. Oldham started, and that is continuing to move forward, and I think that's going to help providing the best surgical care for pediatric surgery uh, patients. We need to evaluate the surgical care of patients in rural and underserved areas, as well as globally and then continue to partner with the American Academy of Pediatrics and subspecialty organizations to look for gaps in our care, potentially even looking at remote and telehealth services, which I think the COVID uh, pandemic has started to increase. So I think there's a lot of opportunities. As I, as I look at the Right Child, Right Surgery initiative, I think it's looking inwards at ourselves as pediatric surgeons, looking at how we provide care nationally, how we provide care globally, and look to see if we can provide better care. I'd love to hear if anybody else has any thoughts. Dr. Reka, I just, um, it, it, it does not apply uh, to our international colleagues, but 
um, the uh, Pediatric Surgery Board, American Board of Surgery, actually uh, looked at that very interesting phenomenon of people doing a, a pediatric subspecialty fellowship before they finish their primary specialty fellowship. And um, in the last couple of years, uh, the PSB um, has um, asked the uh, ACGME to approve a seven-year uh, program uh, in general surgery going through um, the, uh, pediatric surgery without the um, uh, so without the uh, near uh, mandatory uh, research experience in the middle. So you can uh, potentially have an amazing uh, intern uh, who wants to do pediatric surgery and uh, around the third year of your program, you can accept them uh, into your program. And uh, as long as uh, there is a general surgery program director and a pediatric surgery uh, program director in the same institution, it can happen. And then at the end of their uh, um, seven year uh, training program, if they would like uh, to do a specialization, they can do it at that time. So hopefully that would help, um, but um, we'll see. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, an outstanding uh, discussion point. I, I think we're seeing changes you know, the way we train individuals, uh, the rural surgery curriculum is something that is being looked at uh, to improve uh, care to the rural surgery uh, uh, patients that are, are not near a surgeon. Um, maybe using our uh, colleagues that are acute care surgeons, uh, if you look at the literature, children greater than 12 years of age, um, maybe closer in proximity to a, a acute care surgeon who does a far number, of, a large number of cholecystectomies, appendixes, um, and if they have the resources, are they the ones to be uh, providing care to those individuals? So I, I think, again, it's just a real hard look at how we provide care um, nationally and globally to our pediatric patients and, and just make sure that we're providing the right care to the right child by the right surgeon at the right time. This is great. Um, let's keep going on because we got 20 minutes left and we got... Yeah. I there's going to be some, and by the way, the ICG, we can go quickly over because we have a whole session on that later as well. Hey, Todd, can I just make one quick comment on that sure. topic? Yes, sir. So I think everyone knows that, that there's an economic issue involved. Uh, but at the, on the other hand, there's also a practical issue in that the surgeons have undergone, you know, seven, eight, nine years of training. And when they finish their training, they want to be busy. And so that's one reason why they gravitate to the urban areas because they know that they will be busy and can use their training as opposed to the rural areas where they're not, the volume is not gonna be there. So I think that's a, that's a significant factor in, in why the young surgeons don't go to the rural, rural areas. And I think the solution is to, to train general surgeons to do straightforward cases and also to educate them on when they need to transfer to uh, their nearest pediatric surgical center. Thanks. Yes, sir. Dr. Holcomb, I couldn't agree with, with you more. And I, I think that's the rural surgery curriculum as we're looking forward to that kind of a hub and spoke model, developing these partnerships with our community hospitals and, and getting the right surgeon to the right, the right place. And I, I think that is uh, something in the future. So I, I appreciate right. that. Um, our next topic, uh, we already kind of touched on a little bit, but we'll start talking about uh, some 10th edition updates. And, and for the audience as well, I, I failed to mention, I, I took uh, the same tactic that Dr. Arca did. Um, so our references, if you have the slides, my references for these uh, topics will be at the beginning on this uh, initial slide. So um, is it going up? Sorry, I apologize. So the first question, a 10-year-old child is the restrained backseat passenger in a motor vehicle collision. The child arrives to your emergency room and is noted to be hypotensive. He receives a 20 cc per kilo bolus of normal saline on arrival. Despite this fluid, he remains tachycardic and hypotensive. What's the next plus fluid management for this child? A repeat bolus of normal saline. Uh, begin maintenance fluid, D5 half normal saline. Uh, transfuse him with 20 mLs of uh, packer blood cells per kilogram. Uh, provide cryoprecipitate, or does this child not need any further fluid? At this All right, so hopefully people will get this 100% correct, because this is the second time. This is the, what's it called when you repeat the questions? This is, yeah, this is adult learning, isn't it? We, adult uh, learning <laughs> needs three, uh, three, um, three times to present it, right? And don't forget, based on last year's PDC, uh, half normal, D5 half normal saline is not maintenance fluid. It should be normal saline, right? 
Yes. That's right. Or LR. <laughs> or LR. Or LR, correct. It's looking pretty good, actually, um, on the yeah. on the responses. Looking so. Pretty good. Most people are getting are getting it right. So it's it's twenty cc's per kilo of blood. Good. Yes. Yeah. So the most recent tenth edition of ATLS comes out. Uh, damage control resuscitation. Our initial fluid bolus is twenty ml of isotonic crystalloid um, LR normal saline. Um, and then once we do that, we want to begin a balanced transfusion protocol. Typically, uh, ten to twenty ml per kilogram of packed red blood cells and then inclusion of FFP and platelets. Uh, there was a recent study that came out, um, over 700 uh, pediatric patients, 24 uh, trauma centers involved. And they looked and saw that of the patients who received a second uh, bolus of crystalloid, greater than 50% of them went on to transfusion. Um, and so what we were doing is just delaying the, the transfusion. We're delaying the packed red blood cells, which we need for oxygen delivery, intravascular volume, cardiac output. And in those individuals who had late packed red blood cell transfusion, we saw that they had overload of volume, increased hospital stay, increased ventilatory stay. So I, I think the literature is coming around. Uh, these were adult initially um, data that drove this, but the pediatric literature is coming around as well that you provide one initial bolus of 20 per kilo of isotonic crystalloid and then start your packed red blood cells. We can start to discuss uh, massive transfusion. I wanted to include that here a little bit because life-threatening hemorrhage, um, while rare in children, if you look at a large NISQIP database, less than 1% of patients receive a massive transfusion. That, that data may be a little skewed um, because the, defi the definition of, pack of a massive transfusion protocol um, is not really standardized, but those children have a 28-day mortality of 37 to 50% if you look at our uh, NISQIP data for, for trauma. Um, so it's pretty significant. They have a significant risk of acute respiratory distress as well as renal failure. As I noted, there is no clear definition, but most people would suggest um, that 40 cc's per kilogram over a 24 hour period is starting to um, quantify as a massive transfusion protocol. And, and that may be semantics. Really what we wanna start talking about when we look at massive transfusion protocol is a balanced resuscitation. So you want to start to look at one to one to one of packed red blood cells, FFP, and then platelet. And there is a larger study coming out of Harborview that looked at this through the, uh, the trauma database where children who were closer to a one to one to one ratio had improved mortality. So we want to give this in a balanced resuscitation phase uh, that is going to really replace what the child has lost. All right, hold on, Rob. I don't sure I get it. I need you to give me rapid fire here. Kid comes in. They let's say it was like uh, I don't know, their their leg was cut off and they're like hosing out blood. So I know they've lost a lot. Can I call massive transfusion protocol? Hey, yes. okay. So mechanism of injury or whatever in my mind thinks it's going to be a lot of blood, I can call massive transfusion protocol. You got it. Fine. Second question. By while while we're talking about this, can everyone out there please write if they have something like that in their hospital internationally all over the world? Because I don't know if this is regional. If this is does everyone have a massive transfusion protocol thingy at their hospital? So then they come in. It, and is there, let's say they're not like hemorrhaging, uh, obviously they have a, a solid organ injury or something. How do I know when to call it when they're in the hospital? What other indicators? So I, I think truthfully, Todd, I think the, the answer there is if you're starting to think about giving several units of packed red blood cells, you want to start to call a massive transfusion protocol. And that, that, that is where the definition okay. becomes difficult. You want to start to get that balanced resuscitation. I want it early. I want, if I'm giving two to three units of packed red blood cells or 20 to 30 per kilo of packed red blood cells, this child needs FFP, this child needs platelets. We need to be doing this in a balanced resuscitation. And, what, and, and just to clarify, so first of all, I've never been got my, both of my bosses are on here. Neither of them have yelled at me yet for calling a massive transfusion right. protocol. So I've never been punished for over calling it. Um, the question is um, just for those who don't have it, because some don't have that. Basically, what does this tell the lab? Like what gets activated when you do this? Yeah, it tells the lab to re release those resources uh, for the FFP, for the platelets. Uh, you know, there's platelet shortages. We need to make sure that we're, um, we're also looking at our electrolyte abnormalities that could potentially be uh, present, looking at calcium, potassium. We need to be paying attention to the resuscitation of this child. 
Um, and so really, I, I think it goes to say that we are providing a very close look at how we're resuscitating this child from all angles and making sure that we have the resources. Not every um, hospital has a blood bank inside the hospital. You may be trying to get the blood bank from down the street to provide those resources, right? So, so how much blood is available, getting those resources um, is really the key. But do you waste blood, like if you don't use it? So not necessarily. It does. It depends because a lot of it's a not cross matched blood. So I, I don't think you're always wasting blood from that standpoint. Okay. All right. Keep going. This is great. I'm learning a ton here today. We're all chatting here. Like this is some rapid fire knowledge here. Keep going. And so the next, uh, the next slide, um, I wanted to touch on whole blood therapy. That's not necessarily an o, um, ATLS update, but we've already touched on it a little bit. So low titer, O negative cold stored blood is an efficient way of replacing the oxygen debt, helping with the endothelial injury and coagulopathy. I'm a, 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 I was in the military, I enjoy military history. It's really fascinating to me that we've come full circle from Korea, Vietnam, back to now thinking about whole blood therapy and providing that as an initial resuscitation rather than starting uh, this um, component therapy. The benefits of it, uh, you start to see that we have less volume required compared to component therapy. So if you look at a whole blood unit of 500 mLs versus 700 mLs when you're looking at um, component therapy, the hematocrit, it tends to be higher in whole blood uh, versus in component therapy. We have more platelets and we have more coagulation factors. So that is where the benefit is coming from. And that is why you're starting to see, at least in the adult literature, um, that we're seeing more whole blood therapy. There are several pediatric trauma centers that are using whole blood therapy. Um, there was a nice propensity uh, control trial coming out of uh, Pittsburgh that looked at this and they saw that there was resolution of shock um, quicker. They had a lower INR uh, after transfusion with whole blood compared to those who had uh, component therapy and they had decreased transfusion uh, volume. So there was significant benefits. It was a small study that did not show a mortality change. I, I don't think it was powered for that. Um, but I think we're going to start to see more whole blood therapy coming up. Cool. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so you know, most people have a have when they say I need massive transfusion protocol. Basically, what you get is a a little a little cooler filled with a bunch of different things, and you assume that it is one to one to one. But when you look back at the volumes and maybe even the concentrations, I've never looked back at the concentrations. But how do you know you're actually getting one to one to one? Um, and then the second question is, do you use TEG to guide your resuscitation? So, yeah, so that's a great question. If you use TEG, a lot of that's institution specific versus Rotem uh, versus TEG and more people are starting to use TEG as well. So I, I think TEG is important. Um, you should be able to, to know that a lot of, and that should be built into your massive transfusion protocol uh, as, you're, as you're developing these. Where do you fall in line with TEG? What's, what do you have available to you? Um, and, and I think really the key as well um, to your point, it, uh, when we look back at what we've transfused, if we're not using a massive transfusion protocol and, and Todd's question of, should we be calling it early? I, I think so, because that's going to start to give you and get everybody in the mindset of a balanced transfusion protocol. If you're, if you're not calling it early, all of a sudden you realize, man, I've given five units of pack red blood cells. Wait, where's my FFP? Where's my platelets? Um, that's problematic. Uh, that, that can affect mortality. And there's been some studies that suggest that. So I, I think calling that massive transfusion protocol actually helps you with the balanced resuscitation that you're looking at. All right. Um, by the way, we've got so many faculty and I don't know if our lower thirds are totally working. So I'm gonna call out who's speaking so the rest of the world knows who it is that's talking. Um, so Rob, we got eight minutes left. Eight minutes, I can knock this out. That's all right, perfect, all right. we're gonna do it. So we're gonna go over this quickly. Um, as part of the PDC, I learn a ton of stuff uh, all the time. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to hear the talk later on as well. Image guide of pediatric surgery. So uh, the question that came up for this, is it going across? Can we move the question across? Sorry guys. Yeah. A six week old infant is diagnosed with uh, biliary atresia. <clears throat> While discussing the surgical approach, I think I moved too far. Sorry. While well, discussing the surgical approach of a Kasai procedure with your resident, she asked what options are available for visualization of the intrahepatic bile ducts intraoperatively. Are there no options? Intraoperative cholangiogram, intraoperative MRI, intraoperative ultrasound, endocyanine green. Um, hopefully everybody gets that answer because we kind of gave it away. <laughs> but you never know. You never know. What does anybody, does anybody use this on the faculty? <clears throat> There's yeah. gonna, yep. Yep, we use it. It's uh, pretty cool. 
does it. We use it a lot for a, a number of indications. Awesome. Well, we'll talk about those. Uh, how did we do on the poll? Were we good, Ellen? Uh, so far, 100%. Well, I can't just change. 80% um, are saying ICG and then 15% uh, is saying the um, intraoperative clandiogram. Great. Yeah. So, uh, well, so I think the indiocyanine green is really what I was getting at with regard to um, a concise procedure. So, there was a recent systematic review that came out of uh, Journal of Pediatric Surgery looking at um, the use of uh, fluorescence guided imaging in pediatric surgery. It's non ionizing radiation. It's picked up by bile, blood, and lymphatics. And so, um, as one of the faculty mentioned, there are several indications for, for use of this. And I look forward to the talk later on. Uh, looking at the biliary tree used in lap coli, there's been some papers that look at uh, using it for a cholecystectomy, decreasing the OR time, decreasing complication rate, being able to visualize the biliary anatomy um, that much better as you're doing your cholecystectomy. Uh, from the Kasai standpoint or a porterinerostomy, just getting better visualization of the fibrous core. Where are you making your cut across the portal plate? Are you seeing those biliary um, uh, <coughs> radicals that are coming up? And so that's been uh, some reported papers. We can look at vascular anatomy of the bowel um, for necrotizing enterocolitis, looking at how well perfused the bowel is. As you're doing a complex a cloaca or anorectal malformation, people have been talking about uh, using this for um, dissection of your anatomy and where you can um, uh, use your, uh, your anastomosis. For, same thing for Hirschsprung's disease. So we're seeing more and more uh, case series, small case series, small case reports discussing this. Can we get the next slide? Hey Rob, really quickly. Yep. For, uh, for this question for biliary atresia, when do you, uh, I may have missed it, but when do you actually administer the, the, the uh, uh, indiocyanine green? So they're in, they're in, um, it's still in it preoperatively, um, and I did not have that paper. I'm looking right here. Um, sorry, I will have to give that answer for you, Stephen. It is a preoperative administration. Some people are even giving it up to um, 24 hours before. So I, for other other things, I don't have that in front of me for biliary trees. I apologize. Um, but they're also looking at it for lymphatic mapping, identifying thoracic duct, chylus leaks, and also for tumor resection, especially hepatoblastoma, um, indiocyanine green is absorbed um, in the liver cells, but it's actually excreted by normal cells quicker than it is by the tumor cells. And so you can actually see uh, a nice play in between the, uh, the tumor cells versus um, uh, the normal liver cells. So this was fascinating to me, uh, again, a, uh, treatment strategy that's really been uh, pushed in the adult literature. We're starting to see more in the pediatric surgical literature, and I, I'm interested to see uh, from the faculty who, uh, who is using this and if they have any thoughts on it. Uh, I'm and someone is asking, in, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, someone's asking in the chat, you know, where you inject it. They're asking if you inject it in the liver parenchyma or the, or the biliary tree or how you use it. It's so it's by IV. It's yes, it's IV. intravenous injection. It's an IV injection, correct. And well, let's, just, keep, let's keep going because we have three minutes and I know we have a whole half, I think 20 minutes on this from Chiro Esposito. Okay. And, yeah. Perfect. We'll go to the next topic, adolescent and sports hernia, which uh, Todd, you mentioned uh, uh, you um, don't always have the answer on this, but I, I looked at your, your talk during APSA for some of this. So I, I thought it was an interesting discussion to have here. So I'm interested to see what your thoughts are. Um, so our question for the adolescent sports attorney, this patient I just saw the other day, 16 year old competitive high school athlete presents to your clinic with a recurrent right inguinal bulge. He actually pops it in and out for you um, and shows it to you. Six foot two inch, 190 pound guy on physical exam, easily reducible hernia on the right. No contralateral hernia, what's the best surgical approach? A mesh repair, high ligation alone, high ligation with a tissue repair, observation, or a high ligation with a mesh repair? Okay, so 16-year-old competitive athlete, recurrent bulge. So he's 190 pounds. Mm -hmm. So what do people want to do? Mesh repair, high ligation alone, high ligation with tissue repair, observation or high ligation with mesh. So Todd, is the word recurrent bulge meaning 
it's occurring broke. frequently or yes. he's had a previous operation? No, no prior surgery. I apologize. It's not, I apologize about that. It just comes and goes. Comes he and needs goes. a high ligation. I agree. Laparoscopic or open wit? <laughs> well, I think most people know that I, I uh, am a proponent of the open operation. So I would do an open high ligation and I would not have a recurrence. <laughs> Use All right. Use I, I'd do a laparoscopic high ligation. And I wouldn't have a recurrence either. You guys are awesome. I, you know I, what I, I, find? I, I personally think, though, that in this situation, you ought to do the operation that you do best. And if you do the laparoscopic approach best, then do that. If you do the open approach best, do that. So do whatever you do best because. The incisions are relatively small. They're not going to be seen if you're doing the open operation. Uh, and so do what you do best. All right. Take us through the data. Perfect. So the data suggests that adolescent children, they have the inguinal anatomy of an adult patient. So uh, again, it's not the same anatomy as we're seeing in our neonates. We don't have overlying external internal rings, but most commonly they have indirect hernias. And so Based on that literature, based on the fact that most of these patients are coming in with an indirect hernia, high ligation is the right answer. And surgical repairs using high ligation alone have been shown to have recurrence rates of 6% or less in numerous studies. That should be similar uh, to the 0% that my colleagues are noting in their, uh, their own personal uh, um, series. Uh, it approaches the recurrence rate seen in both younger individuals who have a high ligation and the older patients who are undergoing mesh repair. So doing a high ligation alone in an adolescent male or female um, has the same recurrence rate um, and is not higher. So it, it definitely bears out in the literature. And, and as has been mentioned, laparoscopic and open repairs are both viable options. And I agree wholeheartedly, do the right, do the surgery that you feel most comfortable with, do the best surgery the first time around, and it should be based on surgeon experience. Um, repair, repairs of recurrent hernias, um, should promote a consideration of an alternate approach. So I, so I apologize if the question wasn't clear at the beginning. If it's a recurrence and you've already had an open repair, you might want to consider a laparoscopic repair or call on one of your colleagues that feels more comfortable with a laparoscopic repair. Um, that also can help you take a look to see if there's a direct or indirect um, hernia present. Um, but really, um, the, uh, the repair should be based upon your own personal um, uh, comfort level. The other facet of the high ligation alone is that it's not associated with the other symptoms that you frequently get from the mesh repairs, the tissue-based repairs. So Todd and I put together a series of long-term follow-up and post-pubertal kids who we did opening little hernia repairs on. I think we did this like in 2012 or 13. And when Todd showed the data, and th this was a survey, they were at least a year out from surgery and they had to be over 12 years old. And when one of uh, Todd's colleagues looked at the data, one of the adult surgeons, he said, no one's going to believe this because it's too good. You've got a low recurrence rate and no neuralgias. And, you know, in the adult world, that, that was always a big pain in the butt when those patients would come back and have severe inguinal pain after putting in mesh. Right. No, and I think looking at that data, I've changed my, uh, my approach. I used to consider putting mesh in an older 16, 17-year-old competitive athlete, put mesh in. I, I've gone to high ligation. I've been happy with that change. I think as um, long as you have the discussion with them and tell them that this may recur, the data doesn't seem like it has a higher recurrence rate, but this is certainly a less invasive. It doesn't have the all the other associated concerns, and it's worth giving it a shot. So, And briefly, I want to just... Another, sorry. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. No, 6% uh, <clears throat> seems a little bit high to me, like typical Lichtenstein repair in specialized centers, it's 2%. And if I remember correctly, for baby hearing, it's like 1%. My, my only comment is, I don't want to get into lab, a laparoscopic or open repair. I think we've had a lot of that, that discussion, but I think I would do a laparoscopy just to get the diagnosis right. Because when you, when you operate on recurrence hernias, on indirect recurrence hernias, you get a lot of uh, missed direct hernias. So maybe in this child, a laparoscopy as a diagnostic tool would be a good idea. Sure, if you're concerned about that, I, I think that's not an unreasonable option. I, I think the range, again, there's a range and that's why 6% or less, uh, you know, I agree 6% is probably on the high side if you're looking two to 6% in the literature for recurrence rates. So it, it just depends on the series you're looking at. All right. 
And then I wanted to touch briefly because it mentioned sports hernias because we all see groin pain and we see a fair number of groin pain in athletes. Two to 20 percent of them can present with groin pain. And and there's so many muscles, there's significant tension applied to that pubic bone during athletic activity. And so the diagnosis of a sports hernia or what can be called athletic pubalgia is really an acute muscle or tendon injury, chronic strain and not necessarily a true hernia. Um, Looking back at the literature and trying to find what the best options are, multidisciplinary management using physical therapy, rest, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories has been effective in 40 to 100% of cases. So the literature bears out that that should probably be our first line therapy and surgery being reserved for folks who are refractory. So six to eight weeks, if not longer of um, multidisciplinary non-operative management, or if you have high level professional um, athletes, they're the ones. So uh, we get a lot of uh, children coming in with a sports hernia request for surgical uh, repair. I, I send a lot of them to physical therapy, put them on non steroidals, rest, um, and they tend to do well. So I, I think that needs to be understood by our, our colleagues and uh, happy to see if anybody has any other different thoughts on a sports hernia or athletic pubalgia. Hey, hey, hey Rob. Hey, yes, Rob, sir. quick question. Is this a new disease or are we? Have we, are we classifying a condition that's been there a long time? And if so, were we doing operations for it previously that, that were the wrong operations or they didn't need it? Or just give us a synopsis of this diagnosis because 10 years ago, you never heard the word sports hernia. Now you sort of hear it every day. Yes, sir. I've, I've heard it for the last 10 to 15 years, initially in the adult surgery practice. It's, you know, and again, a lot of sports hernias and professional athletes. And I, I think we're starting to see that trickle down to our competitive pediatric athletes. Um, this has been around in the, the adult world. And uh, the surgical repair, a lot of uh, individuals feel um, that a mesh repair, and, and these are a tissue repair, really just reinforces, provides some scarring to that area that can then help with the muscle strain. But really, this is a muscle strain or a tendon injury, a chronic strain, repetitive forces, um, the rectus muscle. So many muscles come into that pubic tubercle, and as they're pulling on it, um, that, that really requires rest. Uh, again, some of these you know, high competitive uh, professional athletes, maybe they can't take the rest that's needed. Um, but for the most part, our, our patients uh, it probably can benefit from rest, physical therapy, a change in the way they're exercising, um, a, a change in that mentality. So I, I think we're starting to see that trickle down to, to our population um, and, and really um, the, the non-operative management has been shown to be a benefit in the, uh, the literature as initial therapy. So we're almost 10 minutes over. So let's just, instead of going through the last one, maybe just give us the rapid fire uh, sure. gist of it. Yeah, no. So um, I, I wish I would have saved the APSA um, logo for this last one. Uh, Because really, it's talking about cancer as a chronic disease. um, And what we're doing is we're saving lifetimes. And so I'm going to move over to the, I'm going to skip through the question and really focus on uh, this first slide that I have. Overall survival rate for childhood cancer is approaching 80%. Some childhood cancers is nearing 100%. But two thirds of these children have long term effects. Some of these are severe or life threatening. And these children are leaving pediatric surgical care, going to adult. primary care providers um, who may not know their history, may not understand what the child disease was. Every organ system can be affected, including psychosocial. So really when we're taking care of patients who have underlying childhood cancers, we need to view this as a chronic disease. And the last slide that I have really focuses on um, two study uh, groups, the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study and St. Jude Life. Um, who have shown that intestinal obstruction can be seen in upwards of 6% of patients at 35 years in children with abdominal pelvic tumors, something that we may be expect as a pediatric surgeon, but even things that we don't expect. Um, children who have uh, pelvic radiation have an increased risk of anorectal disease, um, significant psychosocial effects from the fistula and the complications from that. Uh, children also, depending on the type of chemotherapy, may have an increased risk for late cholecystectomy, And then even children who don't receive um, chest radiation, but are receiving uh, other medications or may have underlying leukemias, we're seeing that um, they may also develop breast cancer early, so early screening. So 
really, I think we've seen a change in mindset. We have some great study groups that are out there. I recommend people looking at these articles. There's a ton of articles out there, and I listed several of them at the beginning of um, this segment from the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, St. Jude Life, and it's going to provide you information to provide your patients about the long-term effects of the therapy we're providing as a child. We focus on the here and now, but what about 10, 20, 30 years later? And we have some great data now that's coming out showing that there are some long-term effects. We need to be aware of that and we need to counsel our patients on that. This, this, I, let me just tell you guys something. Uh, I love your session. Uh, you guys did a great job. The PDC always does a phenomenal job of rapid fire. Let me just fly through, make sure I got this here. This is what we just learned in the last... Uh, Hour. I mean, we can argue about the best way to do this course every year because the goal is to get as much information in as possible, but clearly we never feel like we have enough time to discuss any of the topics, but at least it gets it in our brain. Family-centered care, cancer is a chronic disease, changes in ATLS. We talked about that a couple times, which shows us about whole blood. Tag was brought up, the idea of early blood, button battery and honey. You can't give honey to the little babies, but you can give sucrophate. This is great stuff. C. diff. I didn't know any of that stuff, but that's no big deal. I don't know much of any of this stuff. So C. diff, we know that um, it doesn't really help in the little ones. After two, it does, but only after you've checked everything else. Um, right child, right surgeon, really a U.S. topic, but brought up. I love all the chat of all the people all over the world who had very different models for pediatric surgical care. We need to stop independently looking at our own and share other ideas. I love this Enrica idea. I don't know if it would work, but it's amazing. All right, hernias. We'll never get to the bottom of that. I think the big deal here is that uh, there's, we're starting to see that high ligation in these adolescent patients is, that is behaving the same as a child so that it's probably okay and has much less of the consequences of putting mesh in as long as you have that conversation with the parents. Um, and then screening for esophageal atresia, that we need to have this protocol that, gosh, I can't remember it anymore. You give the, for a year, I think 12 months of PPI, and then you get three scopes until they're 18 and then blah, 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 hand them off to someone. But the point is Marge is going to give us that for all of you on here, we're going to be making sure that you're updated on these protocols, on these guidelines, on these new facts by making little clips of videos after this is done. Amazing PDC presentation. Thank you, Rob. Uh, thank you, Mars. This was fantastic.